all heard of the saying, living in a bubble. Well, imagine if it was true. Guess what? It is. This is a family home in Queensland, a bold architectural statement that celebrates the beauty and simplicity of the humble circle. Some of Australia's best gardens are hidden behind the fences. You'll be really surprised. How do you turn an old coffee table into a dog bed? Perfect, your four-legged friend. Karen's trick to a spectacular Thai curry. The secret lies in the curry paste. This little fella, well, his name is Charlie. Now, he actually belongs to my neighbours next door, so he's not our dog. But the great thing about Charlie is he loves to come and pay his visits. Sometimes he stays for the day, sometimes we're lucky enough to have him for sleepovers. When he does stay, I love to make him feel super welcome and comfortable. So what I want to do is make him his very own doggy bed for those little stayovers. So this one is not going to be just any doggy bed, though. It's going to be super grand, a four-poster. Only the best for you, Charlie. What do you think? I could build this doggy bed completely from scratch, but honestly, you really don't have to go to that much effort. If you've got an old pine or a strong coffee table like this, as you can see, if you flip it upside down, you've already got the basis of a four-poster bed. The only thing with this is I don't actually need all of this excess. So the first job is to unscrew the top. I could reuse this top, it's a great piece of timber, but to save cutting it down and just make life a little bit easier, what I've done is I've just headed down to Bunnings, given them my measurements, and they've cut me a piece of MDF to the exact size. So this goes down, and once this goes on top, you can see it's nice, neat, and flush. At this stage, it's probably a good idea to use some PVA glue. Now, this makes the joint nice and strong. A great suggestion if your dog's a little on the portly side, as is young Charlie. If any little bits of glue just squeeze out of the edges, take a damp cloth and just wipe away the excess. So using the same brackets and the same screws, we'll just fix the new top to the base. Now if you don't have any of these, you could always use little angle brackets or you could just screw it from the other side. To elevate the bed just a little off the floor, which not only looks better, but will also keep Charlie out of the draft, I'm adding these bun feet. You can buy these from Bunnings. So I'll flip it upside down and then I can screw from the other side. It all adds to the decorative appeal. I do admit this project takes a little bit of thought because these were once the legs on the underside. Well, now they're the legs on the top side. They're actually the four poster legs. These look a bit shabby. I think I could either fill them or I could keep going and just kind of stack up a little more detail. Maybe a little crowning finial on top. To attach these, I'll use a combination of screws and construction adhesive. It just makes them nice and strong. Everything gets a light sand and then it's on with the paint. I'm loving how the beds are coming up, fit for a prince, but I do want to add just one extra detail for Charlie and that's a bed headboard. Easy enough to make. What I've done here is just taken some MDF and I've shaped it using a jigsaw. You could have it straight across, it's really up to the style that you want. Now to make this padded so it's really comfy, I'm using wadding. You can find this just from the craft store and I'm using a double layer that makes it extra squishy. To apply it all, I'm just using my staple gun. It's on with the wadding first, just a couple of staples to hold it in place, wrap it around the top, and then for over the top of that, I've got this lovely fabric. It's like a linen, it's a soft, sagey gray. It'll match the house perfectly. A headboard like this not only looks good, but I do think it offers dogs just that certain sense of security. You know how they like to snuggle up against a wall and just feel secure in a snug place? Well, this is the perfect thing. Just 
to neaten up the back here. A piece of fabric. It is a piece of furniture after all. It's a nice idea to put your puppy dog's name along the side of the bed. You can buy these MDF letters from the craft store and paint them any colour you like. Instead of measuring, which is a bit of a palaver, I just like to use a bit of blue tack on the back, position them, and when I'm happy, stick them down with construction adhesive. If you do have any sharp hardware like these little brackets, you can always cover them up just with a baseboard. So this just sits neatly over the top. Then I think it's in with the comfort. A couple of pillows. These ones are nice and soft, I think you'll approve. The good thing about these two is you can wash them easily. And then over the top, doggy blanket to create the complete luxe look. Just might tuck him in at the edges. I think all that's missing now is one very spoilt pooch, don't you think? Whether it's for an afternoon snooze or an all-night snuggle, I reckon your fur baby will be bound to dig his or her new bed. Don't you think, Charlie? Yeah. I love showing you things that are different, like how to use a square to mark a circle. Now, it might be called a circular saw because the blade is round, but it's not usually used to cut circles, but today, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And why would you need to cut a circle out of timber? So you can make a very stylish cheese platter. First up, I've just got to find the centre of my board. I'll just be going from corner to corner. All right, I now have my centre mark and drilled a hole. So, on a scrap bit of timber, I've just transferred that measurement and drilled a hole. Now I can get a screw, put it through our timber, and then put that through our centre mark and fix it off. We need to attach our circular saw. We just want to make sure that the blade is up against the edge where we took our measurement. To attach the saw, I've just screwed through the base plate. All right, now this is the most important part to be able to use a circular saw to cut a circle. It's about setting the depth. With your blade, you'll see that you've got a kerf, which is the distance between the tip of the blade and where the solid blade starts. You can't go past that point. So the trick is to do minimum depth and multiple passes, not minimal depth. <laughs> and now you've gone around once, set your depth a little bit deeper and do it again. And there you go, a circle cut with a circular saw. But that's not all this tool can do. Now I'm going to use it to create a decorative edge. To do that, I'll just turn the saw on a 90 degree angle and push the blade up against the opposite edge. And there you have it, a platter using a circular saw. Now I just need to sand it and put some oil on it and it's ready to use. If you want to impress your friends at your next gathering, make sure you have a go at making one of these. They will love it and everything that's on it. One of my favourite places to escape to for a Sunday drive is the Southern Highlands in New South Wales. Beautiful weather. It's cold in winter, warm in summer, fertile soil, and some of Australia's greatest gardens are hidden behind the fences. We're at Red Cow Farm in the village of Sutton Forest in New South Wales. Now, when you fly past at 100 k's an hour, you get a glimpse and you think, wow, it's when you go beyond the gate and see what's out the back, you'll be really surprised. See what I mean? This unique, ambitious Cool Climate Garden sprawls over two and a half hectares and is arguably one of the finest in the country. It's made up of a mind-blowing 20 themed garden rooms. All created over the past 26 years by two guys with an amazing vision. Wayne Morrissey and Ali Mentech. 
So Ali, the front is beautiful, but it doesn't suggest what's out the back. This to me is like a beautiful European garden. This is all our indulgence. I love gardening. Yeah. But you must love gardening because you couldn't do anything else but this, could you? Well, it's indulgence, but it comes with an absolute obsession. That combined, I think, for the love of plants. If you told me the garden was as old as the cottage and it was heritage listed, I'd believe it. Uh, sometimes people think it, this was like an old monastery maybe once, or our trees, they think it's some of them are since the, the beginning of the cottage, which goes back to, you know, the early 1800s. When you got the property in 92, yes. what was here? Uh, it was actually a paddock. There was absolutely nothing here, not even a tree that we could use. Everything is uh, planted since then. So when you yeah. started, you had a background in hospitality. Yes. What was your thought process? Did you think, oh, I might have a hedge around the border, or did you always have this as your grand plan? It was kind of ambitious. And kind think, of? Yeah. <laughs> the Southern Highlands is really offers us a great opportunity to grow so many variety of plants. I love, one of the things that I do is to um, really get to know each plant, uh, what conditions they prefer, and give them the best microclimate as possible, so see them at their best. So planting the right plant in the right position right means position. you're gonna get the right result. You're gonna get the right result. And the room that we're in now, which one's this? Uh, this is what we call the Abbess Garden. The Abbess is the name or title given to the head of the convent. What I like about it is it's not heavily landscaped, but it's still got structures. So all this buxus and these yes. cones <clears throat> create boundaries and formality for the wildness of the, the beds behind them. It's, I think it's a very much a tried and tested is to have the exuberant planting, very much like cottage style, but it's strongly framed by whether it's a hedge or topiary. And these cones, any symbol to them or anything like that? The shape of them represents the monks uh, working in the field. So we decided to make them into cones. They look a bit like me, <laughs> short and fat. <laughs> So you obviously love your roses, but have you got a favourite that's in this yard? Because I've definitely found mine. This is our Laura de Vost, and it's always a great spectacle this time of the year. Simple structures to, to get it up and give you the height in the garden. Yeah, I think it roses, particularly ones that need the support, but I don't think you need fancy supports for them, as long as it's strong enough. This magical garden truly is inspiring. And as you venture into it, it's like going on some kind of magical botanical tour. Every time you walk through a hedge, you go into a different room. Now, this is called the Apollo Walk. It's very structured. The branches have been raised up on these rowan trees to expose their trunks. And the hedge that lines the walk is called hornbeam. Now, I've never seen a beautiful specimen of it in Australia. It loves the cold, and I've seen it in castles in Europe. And if you look closely at the leaf, it looks like a crinkle cut chip. This part of the garden is very simple, 50 shades of green, but it rests your eye and makes you want to see what's next. In Ali's original design, this was the driveway that curved around the little cottage and you left through a different exit. But then he just saw so much potential in it that he built this pergola. All the stonework he did himself, he got a brick here to do the piers. So with the height and the structure like this, what else would you plan except for beautiful climbing roses? Now it looks like it's been here for hundreds of years and it's got a couple of hundred still to come. It's amazing what you can do with space. This is not your typical suburban block where the garden beds hug the fences and everything's straight lines and so-so. Here you've got room to let things breathe. I mean, that is a massive water feature. It's a beautiful restful spot. I'd love to sit here, but I'm glad I'm not doing those hedges. Apparently, the ladder goes in the water and so does the gardener. Climbs in, prunes it all, and then with a pool scoop, cleans it all up. 
but it's where you get size that matters in a garden like this. These garden beds are probably 10 metres across, full of all the colours of a rainbow. It looks unkept compared to the formal hedge, but I bet you there's just as much work that goes into pruning and shaping and deadheading this as there is in pruning that hedge. The level of skill and design at Red Cow Farm is just mind-boggling. Coming up, a woodland and a man-made lake that would inspire Mono. Sometimes you might have a small job around the house where you need to put these tiny little brads in and it's hard to do and most of the time you end up hitting your thumb. Or you might be doing a small DIY project where you need to put large nails in. Well, you'll be surprised to know with the household items that you have laying around that can help you and actually stop you from hitting your finger. And I've got four to show you now. First up is a trusty bobby pin. A lot of the boys will remember when they're growing up, their mum used to put them in their hair. That <laughs> made me joking. But look how handy this is. You slide the nail in, that holds it for you. You just sit it on the timber, and away we go. The second one is blue tack, or in this case, green tack. We just break it off. There we go. I can stick it down where I want to put my nail, and I put it in. Look at that, the nail's embedded, ready to go, no fingers damaged. The third one is a little bit of cardboard. I'm going to push the nail through the cardboard. It holds the nail in place. Then we sit that on the timber. We start nailing it. We can take the cardboard off and we're right to go. And the fourth one is the peg. It makes sense, I'm pretty sure you can see what I'm going to do here. I'm going to put the nail into the peg it's going to hold it for us, put it over the timber again, fingers out the way. And I reckon that's pretty cool. And it's going to save you from getting those damaged fingers every time. We can thank you later, all right? At this time of the year, there are some great fun projects you can be doing in your garden that you'll really enjoy and your plants will perform better for it by the end of the weekend and there is nothing like getting in at, with this weather looking so good. But first, just have a look at my dahlias. I just love them. I used to grow them as a kid, and as an old codger, I'm still enjoying them, maybe even more. Now, these were from last year, and you can see that the stakes are over two metres tall, and so were the plants. They were right up here. So this year, we've changed our tactics a little. We've got a special frame and we're treating them quite differently so we get more flowers. The last thing you want are your perennials, your bulbs and your really lax sort of plants flopping all over the ground and you don't get the flowers that you really want. Let me show you how to make this. Now to make our frame you'll need four hardwood stakes. And basically we're going to support the wire mesh with some little pins that we'll put through. Now, every 30 centimetres, we'll put in the holes and hold the mesh. Let me show you. Now, they all need to be equal distances along the post so that your wire mesh is lying nice and flat. You don't want it wonky. Now, the wire mesh, you can buy this at Bunnings, the hardware stores have got it, and in large sheets. And just use a wire cutter, bolt cutters, just to cut them off into 500 square. Now, this is where those little off-cut pins really come in handy. You can use them to put through the bottom of each of the holes in each of the stakes. And then, just feed your wire frame down until they rest on the pins. Now feed the plants through, your shoot's coming up before you put on any more wire mesh. The earlier you start with the framing, the better the plants will be. And it takes about two or three days on a warm sunny day like today. They get pliable and they start to grow, then you can feed them through the wire right up to the top. After a couple of days, your dahlias will be growing through. And the advantage of this system is that the plants are nice and open. You get more flowers than tying them up tight to one single stake. That's how you get your best dahlias every year.
street, it all seems quite normal. Semi-rural, quite suburban. Part of this unique address, there is a family home that is as quirky as can be. Let's go back to that no place, no place like Hello, Sharon. Hi, Hello. Graham. How are Hello, you? Sharon. Lovely to meet How you. Oh, you too. Thank you for having us here. This is wild. When you drive down the street, it certainly captures your attention. Yeah, it certainly fans out a bit. Why the circle? Um, and the fascination with the idea of circles. I did it at a, uh, in theory, yep. my final year of architecture, and I thought, well, let's see if it works. Wow, so we're going to live the dream. <laughs> yeah, literally live the dream. Can we have a look, have a look around? Of course. Certainly. So I get that you wrote the thesis, but how do you go from that to designing this home? Well, first off, I designed it on plan. Yeah. Then I did a prototype of a metre by metre panel of the shell wall. Yeah. Took it out to uni, got them to test it. The tests came up all right, and we started building it. No, I think that's the easy version, would that be, Sharon? Because, I mean, when did you actually first start building? It was Father's Day 83. Yeah, this was all before computers. One of the dimensions on where three domes came together took me six pages of manual mathematical calculation to work out. Oh, wow. The more they told him it couldn't be done, the more determined <laughs> he was. <laughs> I mean, how do you actually build your spheres? The concrete is like normal concrete, the yep. floor. Then we um, rolled water pipe to the correct um, diameter. Yeah. Then we put some reinforcing bar horizontally. Then we put two layers of metal lath, which is just expanded metal. Yeah, OK. Right? And then we pumped it on and then trailed it off. There's 350,000 wire ties in this. <laughs> and sure. no, no, I didn't count them. <laughs> I worked it's it out Calculation. From I worked it out from how much wire I bought. It took me a little while to get used to it when we first moved full time because it was very different. We yeah. lived in a traditional Queenslander for 25 years. Oh, wow, you couldn't go any further no. away. Well, can we have a look inside? Of course Most you can. Certainly. Oh, this is wild. <laughs> oh, I love this. These stair treads represent the floor plan of the house. Brilliant. Do you know what? It is quite... It's like deceptively large in here. I think from the outside you feel like it might be quite small, yeah. but it's not. Everybody actually says that. You really were, to pardon the pun, ahead of the curve. I mean, most modern day architecture is about actually opening up spaces and linking them and having that connectedness. Yeah. If you look here, you, you've, you've done that. That's right, there's about a thousand square metres under it. A thousand square metres? Yes. That's huge. One thing that puts a lot of people off curves is it does add cost and it certainly creates challenges. I mean, straight edges are much easier just to whack a bed <laughs> up against or to whack a table up against. I mean, yeah. how, did you, how did you face those challenges? It took a long time. I think the, the couches in the, in the drawing room probably took us about two years to find because we wanted a certain style. They also needed to sit back yeah. into the domes as well. We don't really have a lot of curtains. Um, mainly, I think, you know, Graham wanted to come up with an, with an idea that... I love that. It's like an iris. <laughs> That's actually it so is. cool. Yeah. And um, what happened there, it was 10 o'clock Sunday night. Yeah. And I just couldn't quite get it to work. So I rang up NASA. <laughs> get out of town. <laughs> I thought I heard they had something similar yeah. on the Mars probe. About four days later, I got some plans on what they did on the Mars probe. And then that's basically well, signed off that. Well, it didn't or, or sort of help tweaked. me, but it was just... That's I didn't even think I'd get through. No, I, I didn't even imagine that they'd be picking up the phone and asking <laughs> <laughs> to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Does he ever switch that brilliant brain off? No, it's like being married to the nutty professor sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So which was the most difficult room in the home to fit out? Believe it or not, it was the kitchen. Obviously, it still had to be a practical working space, but the difficulty were all these curves. A lot of kitchen companies just said it was way too hard. So Sharon and Graham ended up finding a shipwright. Now, he obviously works with curves all the time. When Sharon said, you must hate coming here, he said, nope, at least your house is still. And people often complain about not having enough storage. Well, here, there is storage all the way to the heavens. In 
In a house that celebrates circles, of course, there'd be a circular staircase. But the other striking thing that you notice immediately are these incredible water fountains. They actually serve as a dual purpose. They've got an air conditioner at each top, and they were designed and built by Graham, of course. Upstairs, four bedrooms open up on this impressive central gallery. Or as there has to be a round bathroom, right? Complete with its own special iris window. Hands down, my favourite room in the house is this, the library. Look at all these arches and curves. It all comes together so beautifully, but the hero, without a doubt, is this. This is Graham's original thesis that started the entire desire for the home, every single page hand-typed. And believe it or not, you can actually get a copy of this in the National Library in Canberra. So cool. So Sharon and Graham, what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have of the idea of living in a bubble house? I think they probably think that we, we came from another planet, but anyway. <laughs> As you can see, we're, we're normal people, if not a little bit eccentric, but that's about as bad as it gets, you know. To steal a line uh, from Pete Colquhoun, the architect of our show, he says that man created right angles and God created curves. And it's nice to see a couple who appreciates it. Yes. <laughs> so, Very good. So thank you for showing us through. You're not welcome. A problem. We're visiting the magical gardens of Red Cow Farm in the southern highlands of New South Wales. This incredible vision of two men who dared to dream big. And just when you think you've seen it all, Ali reveals yet another surprise around the corner. It's the garden that keeps on giving. Definitely. What room is this one? Uh, this is the uh, monastery garden. Ooh. And <laughs> it's a very intimate rectangular shape and the, the box edging is planted so it gives us the, the shape of the Celtic cross. Does the wishing well work? <laughs> <laughs> no Sydney bears to win the comp. Must be broken. <laughs> You've got hard walls at the two ends. Yes. And then green walls on the side. Mm -hmm. Well, this one, it was deliberate to have because the walls offer me a different perspective. And I think walls is also, gives me more of the cloistered look that I wanted. I love the uh, ivy shaped around the arches. It really accentuates it. It was built in such a way that it gives us the depth. Is that you? Uh, the one on the right is. <laughs> And in any great classic garden full of intricate, heavily planted rooms, it's always good to come up for air. Sometimes. Uh, this is the, the beach walk. And nothing does it like a beautiful, clear stretch of lawn. The lawn's spectacular as well. Soft leaf. Is it a fescue or a ryegrass? Uh, this is a bit of both, really. It's the cool climate grass called the Canberra Bland Canberra or Highland Bland, Bland yes. Yeah. So the hedge that borders it is beech, mm -hmm. and yes. I noticed that there's a touch of lime and a touch of burgundy down there and a few shades of green. It was actually always planned to have like a, a tapestry hedging. When we selected the, the material, it was uh, mainly seedlings. So you got variants. You got the variants, but it's subtle. This is a traditional uh, herbaceous border. The whole border is about combination of not just textures, but the color and the, um, you have to manipulate your plants all the time to actually keep them looking fresh, like lots of deadheading, lots of weeding. that hedge over there in the background, it's the same plant. 
So the problem with it is if you turn your back on it, it doubles in size in no time. And if you cut back into the hardwood where there's no green, it doesn't recover. So it's not a forgiving hedge. That's why I plant lily pillies all the time, because you can be a muppet and still have a good looking hedge. Bonjour, monsieur. Bonjour, madame. You'd swear you're in the south of France. The poppies are doing their job, and they're all framed by the backdrop of this beautiful curved wall. Ali did it himself. He wasn't a tradesman. He just picked up a rock and started. It's nice and wide. It looks like it's 200 years old. It matches the cottage perfectly, and it makes this garden look like it's always been here. What's a grand garden without a woodland? Remember back in 92 when Ali and Wayne bought the place, it was just a cow paddock. Lead the way. Where's the rabbits? This is a nice contrast to the walled gardens with the formal hedges. I feel like Robin Hood's about to jump out and rob us. Yeah, forest to hide in. <laughs> and you planted every tree here. Every tree, 26 years and younger, definitely. Before too long, we come across yet another incredible feature. So was that a dam when you started here, or? Nah, this was still a area of paddock. Wow, that is stunning. So this has all been dug out? This has all been dug out with the island, um, and it's been reshaped by hand since then and edged before all the, uh, the planting has taken place. A lot of our trees, of course, some of them are like Taxodium, the Swamp Cypress, Nissa, and quite a lot of Japanese maples are scattered throughout, and rhododendrons, of yeah, course. You mentioned artists before. I can see uh, Monet would be pretty proud of this one. I hope you're proud of your garden. Definitely, very much so, definitely. The fish are even waving to you. They are, there they are. <laughs> thank you to you and Wayne for building such a beautiful garden and opening up to the public. Thank you, thanks so for coming. Credit to you. Thank you, thanks very much. Well, if you've been blown away by Red Cow Farm as I've been, like I said, it's open to the public most of the year. Just hop onto our website for the details, because if you're a garden lover, this is one true masterpiece that you don't want to miss. Now, if you don't have a garden bed, but you'd still like to grow some herbs and veggies, maybe some flowers, you've got to go hanging baskets. But try and get one of these nice wide ones. You can actually mount it up and grow a lot of veggies and have flowers hanging around the outside and fabulous herbs. Now, I'm going to use sphagnum moss. Instead of using coconut fibre or paper bark, you can't buy any more. I want it nice and light, but I want it to retain the moisture. And sphagnum moss, Look at that, it's just fantastic at lining your baskets. Holds the moisture and it's nice and light. So we're just putting the sphagnum all around the outside. When you're growing things in baskets, it's all about moisture retention. Now let's get cooking. Yeah, Karen, we've got recipes in gardening too. What we're doing is making up our very own growing medium. It's more than a potting mix because it has to be light but hold plenty of moisture. What have we got? Vermiculite, nice and light but holds moisture. Seed raising mix, drains well, but peat moss will hold the moisture. By the way, when you buy the peat, it'll generally be dry. You'll need to dampen it down just like our sphagnum moss. Then it's a simple case of mixing them one to one equal ratio. And then using a beautiful spoon, you need to mix it and stir it in. And you've done that, you just pop it in the oven for 30 minutes at 180 degrees. <laughs> Now, 
Now you'll notice I've only half filled it because I'm going to have a mix of flowers and herbs planted into the side because they will hang down and give our hanging basket a great big display below the soil and look terrific. Firstly, some beautiful lobelia. Now you'll buy lobelia in the punnets, just split those up into little sections like that. And then these fellows, you just poke through the side of the wire. Poke the plants from the inside through the holes. It's also handy to select a wire mesh that's reasonable size, not like chicken wire, they're too small. Something a little bit larger, and the plants will recover in no time. Now, this is when you can try something different. If you're into Asian cooking, well, you'd have to go for some Kang Kong, nice and tall. This is the water spinach. How about this beautiful new beetle leaf spilling over? gets much bigger and you can use it for a whole host of things in the kitchen. You couldn't beat sorrel, even on the colour, but the flavour's terrific. And then some regulars, maybe sage, chives, or oh, parsley, of course. And you can't beat some chilies. Now, what's missing? Yes, mint. But it becomes very invasive, takes over the garden. So we're going to plant it into a terracotta pot and then it'll keep it contained. And of course, we've got to add some colour, some beautiful flowers to bring in the pollinators. When you're finished, all you need to do is hang it up, maybe water it once a week, and then you've got your herbal harvest on a hanger ready for your next stir fry or Italian dish. Well, you're feeling like Thai curry. Now, generally speaking, you're gonna pick up the phone, place an order, it can take up to an hour to get delivered, and you're pretty hungry by then. Now, I reckon you can make the most delicious Thai curry at home and have it on the table way before that takeaway is delivered. The secret lies in the curry paste. Now, it's not complicated. We need a few ingredients that we have on hand. I've got some ginger, about a thumb size, three cloves of garlic. I'm gonna smash them up. And I've got three chilies as well. Seeds and all into the mortar and pestle and grind them up. Next in with a couple of tablespoons of Tom Yum paste. Along with my other secret ingredient, some golden shallots. Now you buy these fried, ready to go. That's where we get that gutsy Thai flavour into the paste. Oh, and also a good pinch of salt into that paste. And that's the paste done. Then we're gonna throw it into a fry pan. Fry the paste off for about a minute in some oil and this becomes really fragrant. Then push it to the side and throw in the prawns. I've got 12 of them with the heads on because there's more flavour. After coating the prawns in the curry paste, we quickly take them out of the pan. Now, they won't be cooked at this stage. We're just adding some lovely flavour to both the prawns and the pan. In with some coconut milk next. Hello, Rudy. <laughs> ah, he's joining me. You like prawn curry, don't you? Yeah. Go on, out. Out of the kitchen. We're going again. Rudy, out. <laughs> so, as I was saying... <laughs> is he? OK, sit. Rudy, sit. Good boy. So next in with 400 mils of coconut cream, a couple of lumps of palm sugar, and for that authentic Thai flavour, quite a few lime leaves. It's just a matter of bringing that fragrant sauce back to the simmer. Throw in your prawns, cook them for three minutes, and your curry is done. Oh, let me tell you, it smells super delicious. It is ready to serve on some steamed rice 
Or, to add a different twist, I'm adding some cucumber, stirring it through the sauce for a delicious crunch, and serving it up with some steamed vermicelli noodles, some salted peanuts, and fresh Thai basil over the top. A really delicious prawn curry in no time at all. 15 minutes and it's on the table.